However, China is not our, our only challenge. Our budget also invests $617 million to counter the damaging effects of climate change and additional funds to prepare for future challenges like another pandemic. And we will be working hard to combat challenges that make service in the ranks more difficult for all the men and women of the department, from getting a better handle on the extent to which we experience extremist behavior to combating sexual assault and harassment. As you know, my first directive as Secretary of Defense issued on my first full day in the office was to service leadership about sexual assault. Thank you, General Milley. And I want to personally thank Secretary Austin and his steady leadership and wise guidance. Your joint force is standing watch, uh, protecting American interests in all domains, air, sea, land, cyber, and space around the globe 24-7. We are also fully engaged here at home in both defense support to civil authorities through COVID-19 medical support, as well as homeland defense to keep Americans safe. The purpose of the United States military is simple. It is to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. China is increasing its military capability at a very serious and sustained rate. And we must ensure that we retain our competitive and technological edge against this pacing threat. And equally important are the combat multipliers of teamwork, cohesion, and well-led units. We must resolve the issue of sexual assault, and I and all the chiefs are in alignment with what the Secretary of Defense just said. And we must confront the issue of extremism. Both are corrosive, and the very essence of what it means to be in the military is negatively impacted if we allow them to continue. And we will support and defend the Constitution of the United States always and forever. And I look forward to your questions. Uh, it's critically important that we have an incredibly healthy economy, otherwise you'll never have a, a military. You have to have an educated workforce. You have to have all of these things in order to have a good military. Uh, so if this president's budget requires other parts of the government to have increases for various reasons, fine. Uh, this budget is adequate to defend the United States of America. Uh, and if given more money, we would certainly spend it appropriately in a disciplined way in accordance with the priorities on the EUFA list. Uh, but I fully support this budget, absolutely. Okay. Uh, Israel has been subject to 4,500 Iranian rockets uh, from Gaza by Hamas, uh, but the Iron Dome has been successful. Uh, Mr. Secretary, we could be um, uh, working more closely to promote Iron Dome. Uh, you, you've heard us say a number of times that uh, you know we are committed to the defense of Israel, and uh, and I you know met with. Uh, uh, and I do apologize, gentlemen's time has expired, um, it, so we will move on to Mr. Larson. Do you believe Ukraine deserves lethal weapons uh, support from the United States? I do, and we've provided lethal weapons in the past, but they're lethal weapons for defensive purposes only. I yield back. Uh, in terms of. Uh, taking care of women and girls in Afghanistan. Let me also at the very top say, I really appreciate the bipartisan support that we've seen for, for this. Uh, and I would also point to you that, and you've mentioned this, that uh, our plan is to maintain an embassy there. And through the embassy, we'll continue to work uh, programs that are focused on women and girls. Uh, and I would defer to Secretary Blinken to really outline that. I don't want to speak for him. Okay. So from a military standpoint, can we sustain a fight in the Pacific against China? And I think what we're talking about is a war against China. I think a war against China would be an enormously expensive undertaking in terms of all measures. Uh, and, and I would be concerned about the ability to sustain a long-term conflict. The idea, though, is to deter conflict. Uh, and to keep great power competition at competition and not get it into conflict. But if, if we had a war with China, uh, sustaining a fight would be a significant challenge. There's no question about it. Are you concerned about having sufficient tactical aviation fleet to deter and respond to China in the near term? Uh, short answer is uh, I, I believe that we'll have uh, 
uh, if we stay on pace and invest in the things that we want to invest in. I'm, I'm very concerned about the recent order that you have uh, conducted regarding looking at uh, so-called extremism, and I have sent you two letters, uh, Mr. Secretary, asking for the definition of what uh, the Department of Defense uh, views as extremism and have not heard back from you yet. And so could you uh, just share with me, does the Department of Defense have a clear definition of extremism? A couple of comments on this, uh, on this issue. First of all, uh, I think you've heard me say that uh, on a number of occasions that 99, I believe that 99.9% .9 of our troops are focused on the right things, uh, embracing the right values each and every day. Uh, small numbers of, uh, of, uh, of people can, in this, in this uh, uh, area can have uh, outsized impact on our organization. And so we want to make sure that we're providing the right climate, uh, the right environment for our troops uh, uh, to work and live in. We are not focused, we are focused on extremist behavior, uh, not what people think or what political ideas or uh, religious ideas, but extremist behavior. So. so do you have a definition of what extremism is and what that behavior is? Again, we're focused on, on behavior. Well, you had a stand down and you had a pause over the entire military for an entire day to do training, to talk about this, and you don't have a definition yet of what the purpose was and what extremism is? The, the purpose was to, uh, to, to help, uh, to have a discussion uh, with, our, with our troops and our leaders on the issue of extremism. Okay. And that was very productive. And, and, uh, and again, we were focused on those behaviors that don't, uh, that are not uh, in congruence with with our values in the military. Okay, um, and that, you have ordered Congressman? that there be this uh, commission and have a review. And I guess I just want a little more information. We're going to you're setting up and proposing a new screening capability, um, ongoing continuous vetting of our men and women in uniform. And you're going to develop a policy to expand user activity. So, uh, what specifically would you be screening for? So, as if you set up this screening of our military members, what would be what are you screening for? Our screening is focused on uh, screening those applicants that are coming into, into the military. You want to make sure that we're bringing in uh, the, right, uh, the right type of people, quality of people. So if someone says that they're for President Trump, would that be viewed as extremism? As I said earlier, uh, this is not about politics. I want our troops to, to, to participate in our political system. Well, That's I'll what they're fighting to defend. And, 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 I, but I will also say that, uh, that we will continue to be a diverse, a diverse and inclusive organization. And that's what the United States military is all about. So, so I would just General encourage us time not has to expired on our and liberties. I'm sorry, but time has expired. Um, $500 million in the grand scheme of a $715 billion budget may not seem like a lot, but to the National Guard, that is a lot. Uh, so reimbursing them for their efforts their great efforts. And this is also a year in which the Guard's been doing COVID, they're overseas. Uh, there's a very high op tempo in the Guard. Uh, so that $500 million is very important. I uh, would like to see it reimbursed uh, for, for the National Guard in order to maintain their training and their standards. As we withdraw from Afghanistan, we have not seen an operational plan to save our brave Afghan partners and allies. Now, I recognize that the Trump administration left you with no plans and an even earlier withdrawal date, not to mention that Trump's policy of banning Muslim immigrants would probably have led him to abandon our allies in Afghanistan the same way he abandoned our allies in Syria. Nonetheless, all of this now falls on this administration. We have 80 days until our formal withdrawal date. It takes 800 days or more to process a special immigrant visa. So it's too late for the special immigrant visa process. Secretary Austin, why have you not started an evacuation yet? Well, thanks for the question. And let me say up front that, uh, and I know this is a, a topic that's uh, near and dear to a number of people in this room who have served alongside some of the uh, the interpreters and uh, people who have helped us in the past, and so this is this is important to all of us. Uh, we are working with the Department of State, who has the lead on this, along with DHS, 
uh, to, as one part of a whole of government effort uh, to address this issue. Uh, we are encouraging uh, to, to move as quickly as we can, uh, and we stand ready to provide resources to accelerate this uh, if, it at all pos if it's possible, and it is possible soon. Uh, but, uh, but again, I would defer to Secretary Blinken. This committee has been focused on addressing extremism in the ranks. I appreciate the tone and the, and the direction that I have seen and heard from the service chiefs and civilian leaders. But clearly more needs to be done to take that message at the top and ensure it is received throughout the ranks. How does this budget make necessary in investments in initiatives that seek to address extremism and also promote diversity? Well, there are provisions in the budget that, uh, that, that uh, resource us to continue our, our efforts there to make sure that, that we have the right staffing and, and, uh, and that sort of business to provide oversight. But, uh, but this is accounted for in our budget. So. General Milley? Yeah, I, would, I agree it's accounted for in the budget. Uh, let me make a broader comment on extremism. The United States military is committed uh, to the idea that's America, and it's embedded within our Constitution. Uh, and we are sworn at the risk of our life, our limb, separation from our family to defend that Constitution no matter what. Uh, and there is no room in uniform for anyone who doesn't subscribe to the values of the United States of America. Uh, and I know we're going through a, a work groups, defining extremism, checking out our Department of Defense instructions, et cetera. Uh, but from private to general, there's no room for extremist behavior in the United States military. Thank you, General. Mr. Gates is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, why was Lieutenant Colonel Matthew Lohmeyer relieved of his command? It was a decision made by his, uh, by his chain of command, and typically uh, those decisions are made based upon either having confidence or a lack of confidence. This is issue is under uh, investigation by the IG, and so I won't co comment any further on that. In my previous discussions with service members and particularly officers, I would hear about complaints over parts not arriving on time, long deployments, and in my more recent discussions with those officers, the number one issue that they raised to me with concern, often unable to speak publicly for fear of the type of retribution that Lieutenant Colonel Lohmeyer faced, they say that your stand down regarding extremism did not help our military it hurt the military. And I, I want to share with you that perspective, that it caused service members to otherize one another. It impaired group cohesion. And interesting to me is that I've heard those sentiments most frequently from units that are majority minority, uh, that, that this was not particularly helpful. So I'm, I wanted to give you the opportunity to maybe share with us more specificity regarding the definitions that seem to be a challenge when Ms. Hartzler was asking questions, how should the Department of Defense think about critical race theory? Could I make a comment, uh, Secretary? I'm sorry. Well, I, I'm very limited on my time, General Milley. Well, I, I just want to make a comment. That the well, feedback I know, but I've, I've, gotten I, I've, I've asked the question to Secretary Austin. I, I don't know what the, what the issue of critical race theory is and what the relevance here uh, in, with the department. We do not teach critical race theory. We don't, we don't embrace uh, critical race theory. And I think, I think that's a spurious uh, uh, conversation. And so we are focused on extremist behaviors and, and not, uh, not ideology, not, not, uh, not people's thoughts, not people's uh, uh, political orientation. Behaviors is what we're focused on. But and one final point, and thanks for your anecdotal uh, input, but I would say that I have gotten 10 times that amount of input, 50 times that amount of input, uh, on the other side that have said, hey, we're, we're, we're glad to have had the ability to have a conversation with ourselves and with our leadership. And that's what we need to and, make and sure again, that we remain a And again, reclaiming my time, Mr. Secretary, it, it may be that you're receiving that input in the ratios you describe because it was your directive. It may be that people are concerned about criticizing your decision because Lieutenant Colonel Lohmeyer was not relieved of his command for his actions. He was not relieved of his command because of poor performance regarding his duties. He was relieved of his command precisely because of his thoughts and because of his critique of critical race theory. It is particularly helpful 
that you have said that the Department of Defense does not embrace critical race theory and that you think the discussion is, is not appropriate, I would suggest that it is the ideology that is not appropriate. And it is particularly concerning to me that you have hired a critical race theorist to give you advice on personnel matters, and that person is Bishop Garrison. And I would particularly observe that on July 27th, 2019, Bishop Garrison tweeted regarding former President Trump, he's dragging a lot of bad actors out into the sunlight, normalizing their actions. And here's the relevant part. If you support the president, you support that. There is no room for nuance in this. There is no more, but I'm not like that talk. And then he replies to his own tweet with what seems to be a very ethno-nationalist hashtag, hashtag black44. Could you enlighten us as to what advice Mr. Garrison has given you? And are you concerned that while you testify publicly to our committee that the department doesn't embrace critical race theory, you have hired someone who is precisely a critical race theorist. This, this is the first I've ever heard uh, uh, Mr. Garrison be described as a critical race theorist. So this is new. And, did you, and I'm, I'm sure did you review that he his would... tweets before you hired him, personally? Did Pardon you, me? Did you review his tweets before you hired him? I, I did not personally review his tweets. I would just ask that maybe that that be helpful. Is there anything you can share in just these final seconds regarding any advice he's given you? Let, let me let me just share one other thing that you brought up, uh, Congressman, about the input that comes to me. You know, I trust my leadership from top to bottom that they will give me fair uh, and, and balanced and unvarnished input. And for you to say that uh, people are telling me uh, what they want to hear, what I want to hear, I get it. But I'm smart enough to that know that. Does that does happen. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, maybe they're telling you what you want to hear. Well, I don't know that they even know what Gentleman's I want to hear. This time has expired. There is a correlation, I believe, between the lack of diversity in senior leadership in command positions and the disproportionately high rate of court martial of black and brown service members. Racial bias exists not only in the criminal justice system, as we've experienced and seen for decades and brought to greater public attention after the, the murder uh, of George <clears throat> Floyd, but that same racial bias exists in the military justice system. So these are two related questions. We need to focus on diversity, but we need to immediately get after the disparate treatment under the UCMJ. That we can fix now. That we can fix now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, Mr. Waltz is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to introduce into the record a letter uh, to myself from the superintendent of West Point, Lieutenant General Williams, uh, that was sent to me in response uh, to my letter regarding the teaching of critical race theory at West Point. Is there objection? Hearing none, so ordered. Mr. Secretary, I found that very interesting, your exchange with Mr. Gates on no teachings of critical race theory in the United States military. I want to quote to you a letter I received from the superintendent of West Point. It says, with regards to critical race theory, there is one course that has this theory as part of the syllabus. Uh, there are two lessons on critical race theory. Uh, there is a book on critical race theory titled Critical Race Theory and Introduction. Uh, uh, on and on and on about the teaching of critical race theory in West Point. Uh, I, I just want to emphasize something. This isn't something that we're raising. This, is, this came to me from cadets, from families, from soldiers, with their alarm and their concern at how divisive this type of teaching is that is rooted in Marxism, that uh, classifies people along class lines, an entire race of people as oppressor and oppressed. Uh, uh, I, find, I cannot think of anything more divisive and more uh, destructive to unit morale. I, I want to be very clear. The military needs to be open to all Americans. Absolutely. That is the strength of the United States military. But once we're in, we bleed green and our skin color is camouflage. We're worried about that American flag on our shoulder. That's the only thing our enemies are worried about. I think we can agree there. But the other thing that they raised to me was a seminar that over 100 cadets attended titled Understanding Whiteness and White Rage, taught by a woman who described the Republican Party platform as a platform of white supremacy. 
This is going on at West Point as we speak to our future military leaders. And sir, I would encourage you, I would demand that you get to the bottom of what is going on in the force and further for what it means for civilian oversight of the military when our future military leaders are being taught that the, the Constitution and the fundamental civilian institutions of this country are endemically racist, misogynist, and colonialist, and therefore it is their duty to resist them. What does that mean for a future cadet who one day will be sitting where you are? Uh, and so, do you agree that, will you work with us to, or do you agree that critical race theory should or should not be taught in our military academies? As I said earlier, thanks, Congressman, for the question, and thanks for your continued support. Thanks for your service. Thank you. Um, it, this is not something that the uh, that United States military is is uh, is embracing and pushing and and causing people to subscribe to. Now, whether or not this was uh, some sort of uh, critical examination of different theories, I, I don't know. But we'll, we need to understand we'll, our past. I want to be very clear. But can you agree at least that understanding whiteness and white rage presented in Ike Hall over a hundred cadets probably is something that we shouldn't be teaching? Uh, our, our future leaders of the United States Army? As you have described it, uh, it certainly sounds like that's something that should not, not occur. Again, I would like to know the specifics of, uh, of the Thank issue. you, Mr. Secretary. Ms. Houlihan is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. I know my time is very precious, but I would like to yield some of my time to General Milley because I know that he had some comments that he wanted to make when Representative Gates was talking, as well uh, as Mr. Waltz, about a similar subject of the stand down and, and race theory. Would you like a minute or so to comment on that? Do you remember what we were, what your line of questioning or thought was there? Um, sure. Um, first of all, on the issue of critical race theory, et cetera, I'll, I'll obviously have to get much smarter on whatever the theory is. Um, but I do think it's important, actually, uh, for those of us in uniform to be open-minded and be widely read. And the United States Military Academy is a university. Uh, and it is important that we train and we understand. Uh, and I, I want to understand white rage. And I'm white. And I want to understand it. So what is it that caused thousands of people to assault this building and try to overturn the Constitution of the United States of America. What caused that? I want to find that out. I want to maintain an open mind here, and I do want to analyze it. It's important that we understand that, because our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Guardians, they come from the American people. So it is important that the leaders, now and in the future, do understand it. I've read Mao Zedong. I've read, I've read Karl Marx. I've read Lenin. That doesn't make me a communist. So what is wrong with understanding? Having some situational understanding about the country for which we are here to defend. And I personally find it offensive that we are accusing the United States military, our general officers, our commissioned, non-commissioned officers of being, quote, woke or something else because we're studying some theories that are out there. That was started at Harvard Law School years ago, and it proposed that there were laws in the United States anti-bellum laws prior to the Civil War that led to uh, a power differential with African Americans that were three quarters of a human being when this country was formed. And then we had a Civil War and Emancipation Proclamation to change it. And we brought it up to the Civil Rights Act in 1964. It took another 100 years to change that. So look it, I do want to know. And I respect your service, and you and I are both Green Berets. But I want to know. And it matters to our military and the discipline and cohesion of this military. And I thank you for the opportunity to make a comment on that. Thank you, General. We recognize, of course, that you're operating under certain constraints, but it's alarming to many of us that the President is spending with reckless abandon in virtually every area except our national defense. And our, our current era of strategic competition makes it all the more important that the U.S. recommit the longstanding principle of peace through strength, especially as our key adversaries continue to take meaningful steps to close the gap between us and them. I simply want to say to you, General Milley, that I deeply and sincerely appreciate your comments to Ms. Holohan. Thank you. Yield back. A couple of my colleagues suggested that, uh, that there were service members who uh, were being uh, somehow uh, uh, persecuted because of their political beliefs or their ideological beliefs. And uh, I, I want to First of all, thank you for noting that the attack on the Capitol on January 6th was an attack on the Constitution. Uh, we do need to understand what happened. Uh, it was an attack provoked by the Commander-in-Chief. 
He could have immediately intervened to stop it, and he didn't. Uh, I think it's very important for us to recognize and understand uh, who was in the Capitol that day and why. Uh, and we have to protect the First Amendment rights of our service people, no doubt. Uh, but it's also critically important that we remind everybody uh, that uh, the UCMJ makes it a crime to engage in sedition or mutiny or to seek the violent overthrow of the United States government. So I would urge, as you are focused on uh, getting to the bottom of what happened, we need to do the same here, uh, but we really need to focus on, on that piece of this uh, as well. And with that, I yield back. <laughs> We, we focused on some areas of disagreement, uh, but there was overwhelming agreement on this committee in a bipartisan way uh, about the priorities and needs within our Department of Defense and how to meet those. And I hope we'll, we'll stay focused on those um, and not, not get too obsessed with the areas where we disagree. You know, I want to congratulate Secretary Austin's first not first appearance before this committee, but first appearance, I believe, as the secretary. Um, and we very much appreciate your leadership, uh, and I think you are absolutely the right person for the job at this moment. Glad you are there. Look forward to continuing to work with you. Um, Mr. Rogers, do you have anything for the good of the order? And I has have the highest respect for uh, the secretary and the general, and uh, thank you for your service and being here. And, uh, and I concur with uh, the chairman's observation about this committee's focus on what we need, and uh, we will continue in our bipartisan fashion. So thank you very much, and I yield back. Thank you. With that, we are adjourned. Deep state leaders in our military are instead openly welcoming it, caving to the woke mob on the left. Listen to Pentagon leader chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, defending critical race theory, the idea that all our systems and industries are racist to the core. He sounds more like a spokesperson for the radical left than he does a leader of our military. It is important that we train and we understand, uh, and I, I want to understand white rage, and I'm white, and I want to understand it. So it is important that the leaders, now and in the future, do understand it. And I personally find it offensive that we are accusing the United States military, our general officers, our commissioned, non-commissioned officers, of being, quote, woke or something else because we're studying some theories that are out there. Studying some theories that are out there? Are you studying what China's doing to wipe out the United States? Are you studying what Iran is doing to wipe out the United States? Are you studying what Russia is doing to wipe out the United States? I promise you none of those countries are studying critical race theory and white rage. How about we keep our military as the greatest fighting force this nation has ever seen? This is what's happening now to our military. They're supposed to be training and leading the greatest fighting force in the world. They're not. How about you prepare our men and women for battle instead of this nonsense? I want to welcome in now our panel. Sam Sorbo is here, author of Words for Warriors. Also with us, attorney, Republican strategist, and contributor at Town Hall, Aaron Elmore. Sam, Aaron, great to have you both on the show. Thank you. Good to be here. Aaron, for you first, I'm fired up watching a man who is supposed to be capable of leading men into battle. Instead, he wants to lead them into the classroom to teach them woke nonsense. What happened to combat readiness? This is our military. This is not a college or a university that is teaching theory and ideology. We are here in the military to protect the United States. And I saw that this, ge this gentleman is a very decorated officer, clearly. And what I've learned from some of my friends in the military, that once these people climb up sort of the bureaucracy, they become like any other bureaucrat. He might just want to keep his job, and that's really sad because his job is to keep us safe.